the actress, the steward, and the ocean liner. Sadly, it's not the title of a romance novel. Indeed, romance has very little to do with this tragic tale. Today, we have a case of death on the high seas as we look at the mysterious murder of Gay Gibson. The 1940s were part of the golden age of ocean liners. In the days before widespread international airline travel, the luxurious ships were designed to appeal to the upper echelons of society offering such travellers an exclusive first-class travelling experience to places otherwise unreachable. And so it was that 21-year-old Eileen Isabella Ronnie Gibson found herself travelling on board the MV Durban Castle from South Africa to London in October of 1947. Eileen had just finished a successful theatre tour performing under her stage name, Gay Gibson. Miss Gibson was in an exuberant mood. The tour had been met with rave reviews and she was headed back to London to perform on the West End, a dream she had aspired to for many years. Her stateroom cabin was located on the first class deck and as such, any need or desire she could entertain would be provided during her passage. Each night she would dress in one of her glamorous gowns, brush her glistening red hair, apply rouge to her alabaster skin, and set off to the ballroom for an evening of dancing and socializing with other guests and members of her theater troupe. During her time on board, Eileen's youthful and vibrant glow attracted many a man's gaze, but none more so than James Cam. From the minute Eileen stepped up Board, the 30-year-old James was captivated by her elegance and grace. But James was no first-class passenger. He was no passenger at all. He was, in fact, a ship's steward, and as such, he was forbidden from interacting with guests on board unless, at their request, he was called to assist them. But James couldn't resist. He made excuses to assist Eileen in some way, accidentally bumping into her in the corridors or knocking on her stateroom door. Eileen didn't appear to mind James' attention. Rather, she seemed quite charmed by him, offering coy smiles and flirtatious winks when their paths crossed. James was a handsome man, and to the young and impressionable Eileen, an onboard romance might just top off her otherwise wonderful adventure in South Africa. But James's affection towards Eileen hadn't gone unnoticed and he was reprimanded by senior officers on board who sternly reminded him that fraternizing with passengers was strictly forbidden by company regulations. Rather than dissuade James and indeed Eileen, it seemed to add an extra thrill to their flirty interactions. On the evening of the 17th of October, the Durban Castle held yet another dance for guests. Eileen eagerly prepared, donning her favourite black gown and bright red lipstick. She enjoyed a wonderful evening of libations and dancing with friends. At around 11.30, two of them escorted her back to her cabin. At around 1am and feeling the heat in her stateroom, she wandered up onto one of the higher decks for a cigarette. She was still wearing her gown and heels from the evening soiree. At around 3 a.m., the watchman on duty, Frederick Steer, was alerted to a summons from cabin 126, Eileen's stateroom. The summons was a way for guests to notify stewards that they were in need of some assistance. So Frederick hurried down to the room, noting that both the steward and the stewardess lights were activated. In those days, women would often call upon the assistance of a stewardess to assist them in getting dressed or lacing up their corsets. On board such a fine cruise liner, the option to request assistance from either a steward or stewardess was only available to those traveling in the first class section. So Frederick was puzzled. It was most unusual to request assistance from both a steward and stewardess at the same time. He decided to knock and check what assistance Eileen needed. 
The door opened just a sliver, and backlit by the light filtering out from the stateroom, Frederick saw James. James reassured Frederick that everything was okay and gently closed the door. Assuming that James had been the first to arrive and assist Eileen, Frederick left and returned to his watch station. Others state that he believed James had made good on his bet to sleep with a passenger and left him to it. A few hours later, as per usual, Eileen's stewardess arrived to make up the room. It struck her as peculiar that the bunk was empty. There were unusual stains on the sheets and the porthole in the cabin was open. There was no sign of Eileen and so perplexed, she decided to notify her senior. It didn't take long for a thorough search of the ship to turn up no sign of the young actress. Rumours spread like wildfire throughout the other passengers. Someone had gone overboard. Given Frederick's account of seeing James in Eileen's room just hours earlier, the captain quickly called upon James for questioning. The steward vehemently denied any involvement in Eileen going missing and denied being inside her cabin, going as far as to say that anyone who said otherwise was lying. The captain immediately ordered the ship be turned around so they could scour the water for Gibson's body. He made an emergency radio call to the shipping company's offices in London asking that police meet the ship upon its arrival. The captain didn't reveal the true nature of the situation, stating his request for help was due to complications on board. A return message relayed from Scotland Yard instructed the captain to padlock and seal off the room, disturb nothing. The captain confined James to his cabin for the remainder of the passage. He was examined by the ship's doctor, who found scratches on his forearms, neck and shoulder. James claimed they were self-inflicted, saying that some were caused by a rough towel, while others were caused by him scratching the heat rash he suffered in hot climates. On its return to the UK, the Durban Castle stopped off at the Isle of Wight, where it was boarded by two detectives before it continued to Southampton. Even though the incident had occurred in waters off Guinea-Bissau, the ship was a British vessel sailing under British authority, so responsibility for any investigation fell upon that authority. Scotland Yard soon became involved and a forensic investigation quickly began. James was taken in for questioning and initially stuck to his guns about not having been in Eileen's room. When asked about whether he was in the habit of visiting female passengers in their cabin, however, he began to gleefully boast, stating, quote, Yes, some of them like us stewards better than the passengers. I have been with women passengers several times on other trips. He quickly realized that he had said too much, but when Detective Patrick Quinlan told him they didn't believe his original story. He finally told the officers there may be something in what you say. He had been in her room and he knew why the porthole was open. According to his version of events, he had visited Eileen in her cabin in the early hours. He made it very clear this was at Eileen's request. He then went on to claim that they had consensual sex and Whilst in the throes of passion, Eileen had suddenly died. Just like that, she had stopped breathing. He then panicked and feared he'd lose his job, and so he pushed Eileen, still warm, through the porthole window and into the shark-infested waters 90 miles off the coast of Africa. After doing so, he left her room and turned up for his regular morning post, hoping no one would notice Eileen's disappearance until they arrived at the next port. Showing disregard for his actions, he's quoted as also saying that she made a hell of a splash. On the 27th of October 1947, newspaper reports declared James Cam had been remanded in custody and was charged with murder on the high seas. 
The trial was most unusual for that era, due in part to it being one of the first cases in English legal history where a conviction was sought without there being a victim's body to examine. It also gained some notoriety as for its apparent literary similarities. In newspaper reports at the time, the murder was compared to novels by Agatha Christie. Throughout the trial, James continued to protest his innocence, claiming Eileen's death was naturally caused and not murder. He agreed that his pushing her body out of the porthole was beastly conduct, but that it was done in a state of panic and distress when Eileen had unexpectedly died during sex. I could not find any sign of life. After a struggle with the limp body, I managed to lift her to the porthole and push her through. He maintained he was an honest and good man, that the jury could trust his account of what had happened. The defence called a number of witnesses to claim that Eileen had suffered from a heart condition and had been unwell in the months before her death. They asserted it was entirely possible for her to have died of natural causes during a strenuous activity. Indeed, actress Doreen Mantle, who had shared a dressing room with Eileen during her time in South Africa, commented that Eileen was not a well girl during their tour. She recalled that Eileen would occasionally faint during rehearsals. Her lips would turn blue and she'd have to be taken aside to regain her composure. Doreen did not testify in court, however, as her father convinced her to stay in South Africa and not get involved. Even if she had, the prosecution were well prepared for such a defence. Their stance was that James had viciously strangled Eileen when she refused to have sex with him. They claimed he had seen her drinking and knowing she was intoxicated, thought she wouldn't put up much of a fight. They presented evidence from the ship of urine in the bed sheets. Medical experts took the stand and claimed this would often occur during strangulation. Investigators went so far as to remove the porthole, sections of wall and contents of the stateroom from the ship to use as exhibits in James's trial. But perhaps most damning was James's personal history. Not only had he changed his story about the events of the day more than six times, he also had a checkered record with women. James was a married man with a child at home. He had worked on cruise ships since he was 17 years old and his long stints away had provided excellent opportunity to carry out a number of extramarital affairs. Eileen had been far from his first on board conquest. He had a reputation amongst other crew members as a notorious womanizer. He even carried the nickname Don Jimmy, a play on the well-known womanizer Don Juan. He was known to brag about the number of guests he had bedded at the end of each voyage, always trying to outdo his previous record. The police investigation found no shortage of women willing to testify about James's unwanted and unrelenting advances on board previous cruises. One Miss B testified that whilst taking an afternoon nap in her cabin, she found Jimmy kneeling by her bed. I immediately got up, but before I could completely rise, Jimmy pushed me back onto my bed, holding my shoulder. I then struggled to get up, but did not succeed as Jimmy got on top of me, his whole body covering mine. In view of the weight of this man on top of me, I was unable to shout, and at the same time, he held down my shoulders and kissed me. It was all such a shock to me that I cannot remember all that happened. I told him my aunt was next door to me. This had the desired effect, and Jimmy got up, but he forced me down onto the bed. Again, this time I knocked on the wall and then Jimmy got up and told me to stay as he was going to fetch my tea. He then left my cabin. In response to the exposure of James's record of unwanted sexual advances, Eileen's own personal history was called into question by the defense. 
It was claimed she had spent the better part of her theatre tour bedding handsome but unquestionably married men. And in what may have caused many to gasp at the time, a contraceptive device was found in her luggage. Witnesses claimed she had told them she was pregnant in the days before boarding, and another stated she had been upgraded to a first-class cabin on the cruise liner by a nightclub owner she had met on her tour. James had told the jury Eileen had seduced him, asking him to bring her a drink in her room and opening the door wearing nothing but a yellow silk nightgown. When Eileen's mother took to the stand, she fiercely defended her daughter's reputation, stating, quote, I am proud to be the mother of Gay Gibson, one of the finest types of English womanhood physically, mentally, and morally. End quote. She also denied that Eileen owned such a nightgown as James had claimed. In fact, her sleeping attire, a set of black satin pyjamas, was missing from Eileen's personal effect and is believed to be what she was wearing when forced through the porthole. After closing arguments, the jury took just 45 minutes of deliberations to determine James was guilty of murder on the high seas. Asked if he had any words to say before his sentencing, James stated, My Lord, at the beginning of the case, I pleaded not guilty. I repeat this statement now. That is all. He was sentenced to death by hanging. In a strange twist, the sentence ended up being commuted to a prison term. This was due to the British Parliament at the time considering abolishing the death penalty. This meant all pending death sentences, including James's, would be commuted until Parliament had made a ruling either way. In the midst of this unusual situation, Winston Churchill commented on the case directly stating, quote, The House of Commons has, by its vote, saved the life of the brutal, lascivious murderer who thrust the poor girl he had raped and assaulted through a porthole of the ship to the sharks, end quote. In 1948, James's appeal against his sentence was denied. After serving just 11 years in prison, he was released under license. Upon his release, he sold his story to the highest bidder with papers positing the question of whether he was guilty or not. Despite the tragedy, Eileen's mother found herself having to once again defend her daughter. In the years after the event, she had also lost both her sons to accidents, leaving her and her husband mentally and emotionally broken. Things soon went quiet for both parties until 1967, when James once again found himself serving prison time after he attacked a 13-year-old girl. For this, he served just two years inside and was less keen on press coverage after his second release. Instead, he changed his name and moved to Scotland, where he worked as a waiter. However, just months later, he was arrested again, charged with sexual misconduct after attacking three 11-year-olds. He was returned to prison where he remained until 1978. The following year, he died of heart failure. In recent times, the story has been dug up again with investigators and online sleuths claiming James should never have been charged with murder. Anthony Brown, who authored a book about Eileen's death, claimed, quote, If Gay Gibson did suffer any sort of condition that could have led to sudden natural death, it increases the chances of misadventure or manslaughter. In other words, James Cam could have been telling the truth, end quote. Eileen Isabella Ronnie Gibson's body was never found. It will never be known if she was dead or alive when she went into the freezing water. We will never be able to ascertain for certain if James forced his way into her cabin or was welcomed. However, the scratches on his body, the triggering of both steward alarms and his conduct once freed, amongst other things, certainly point to the former being true. 
The story of Eileen's murder has been dramatized and retold over the years from TV episodes to novels and biographies. It seems the actress, the steward and the ocean liner holds its appeal even to this day. Thank you for watching. Right then. Take care and I'll see you next time with another story that will make you say, well, I never.